He is the Clico Policy Holders Group Chairman, Peter Permel. Peter, thank you so much for taking the time to come in this morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rennie, for inviting me. And let me say a, ple- a special good morning to all your listeners, not only in Trinidad and Tobago, but I understand worldwide. You're streaming live on the, on the World Wide Web. We do, and we also put this up on YouTube, guys. So when we are finished with this conversation, anything you, you miss, and there may be a couple of things to miss, trust me, I'm going to ask Mr. Permel to get into, some, into the weeds, as it were. We are hoping that we can have total clarity at the end of his visit here this morning. So I mentioned a couple of things going on here. I think to fully understand the whole situation with the CLF uh, and, and Lawrence Dupre situation, we need to be clear on the shareholders. Let me ask you first, sir, as it stands right now, who owns what in CLF? All right. Let me start by saying um, the, 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 the company that, that we're talking about here today is CL Financial. That was the conglomerate, the $100 billion conglomerate that collapsed in 2009. And that is the same conglomerate that owns quite a number of subsidiary companies, the, the, the most famous of which I suppose is Clico. And they own a 51% shareholding in Clico. Mm-hmm. They own Angus, uh, shareholding in Angostura, CL World Brands, and the list goes on and on and on. But uh, the, the question you asked me, in term, what is important here is who owns CL Financial? Yes. And who are the shareholders of CL Financial? My understanding of it is that you have about 300, and I would say about 25 or thereabouts shareholders who own CL Financial. Mm-hmm. However, of that 325, you have some major shareholders inside of there. The others are more or less small shareholders. And the major shareholders we're talking about here are Mr. Lawrence Dupre, mm-hmm. who owns shares in his own right. And he owns several companies. Dalco uh, is one of those companies who own shares, and he controls Dalco. And therefore, he, there's also a, 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 a trust fund that he is the beneficiary of shares in that trust fund. However, that trust fund is controlled by other uh, some someone else. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, and when you add up those shares, you come up to something like about forty-eight percent of the shareholding of CL Financial. So without getting too confused about all the little companies, we are saying that uh, Dupre basically owns through all these subsidiaries you mentioned, 48%. Yeah, about 48%. About 48%. About 48% right. 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 And what's important is who owns the other 52%. So the other 52% is owned by the other shareholders. And interestingly, one of those shareholders is Corporation Seoul, or the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Mm-hmm. And they own 14%, roughly 14% of CL Financial. And they, they acquired those shares as a result of a particular transaction where they got shares in return for money that they, that taxpayers' funds that they used to pay off certain debts. I don't want to, that's a whole story by itself. I don't want to get into that. Mm-hmm. So that doesn't first be sidetracked. Mm-hmm. The other shareholders would be about 38%. So if you had 14 and 38, you'll come up to about 52%, if my maths is correct there. So, so it means that the 38% represents quite a number of smaller shareholders. Mm. We don't need to bother ourselves mm. with those details, but suffice it to say, Group those, B. Yeah, mm-hmm. so those shareholders got together and they formed a company called, well, with the exception of the government, of course. The 38% got together and they formed a company called United Shareholders Limited. And, th- and that, share, that company, the directors on that company, at least two of them I'm aware of, is Mr. Kirk Carpenter and Mr. Roger Dupree. Mm-hmm. Uh, Roger Dupre is a relative of Mr. Lawrence Dupre. And, 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 and those two p- individuals have been appointed to represent the interests of all the shareholders mm-hmm. other than the Mr. Dupre and the various subsidiaries that he controls and the government. However, they have both come together, the government and those shareholders under this um, entity called United Shareholders Limited, have come together and decided that they are going to... Um, well, appoint the direct, the, the, sorry, the directors who sit on the board, and that's the next important point we'll come mm-hmm. to, we have to come to, who are the directors who sit on the board of, of, of CL Financial. So they have come together in a sort of, or they came together, and, and we'll get to why I'm saying they came together. As, as an accommodation. To, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So because you need, you need to have at least a majority position in order to appoint the directors and so on. And therefore, with a 52% combined majority, they can, in fact, do those things. Mm-hmm. How, however, there has been a, it seems as though there has been a falling out. And we'll come to that, but let me not get into that just, just yet. So let's come back to the board of CL Financial. Now, CL Financial is comprised of a board of seven directors. And the seven directors, you have four directors who, based on a shareholders agreement that was signed in June 2009, mm-hmm. the government it was given the, uh, the, the okay to nominate uh, 
four directors mm -hmm. and the CL Financial shareholders would obviously support them for them to be elected on the board of CL Financial. Mm -hmm. Of those four directors, they also have the privilege of, a, of appointing the chairman. So the chairman uh, is, is, is going to be a, is a government nominated person mm -hmm. and forms part of, the, of those four directors. Okay. And as I said, they are there at the behest of the shareholders, mm -hmm. of the CL financial shareholders. The government has no authority to put them there in their own right. Mm -hmm. And the other three directors are directors who are, represent, who are elected from the same shareholders, but they do not represent the government's interests, so to speak. But I should also mention, in the true sense of the word, a company... A company's directors are not supposed to represent any particular interests. They're supposed to represent the interests of all the shareholders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can't say that because I've right. nominated right. you, then you are there to seek my interests, my parochial and narrow interests, let's right. say as the government. You are there to seek all the, or you're supposed to be there. You're to supposed seek, to seek the seek interests interest of, of the entity, but mindful uh, of yeah. the uh, of the directives the government would like to see executed. Yeah, so it's a very thin line you're walking mm -hmm. there because mm -hmm. you could run into problems with the law if if somebody challenges the decision that you make and say, well, what you that decision is not in the best interest of the company or its shareholders. Mm -hmm. That may be in the best interest of some parochial or narrow interests, mm -hmm. and that is where they have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. Now, so all that was going fine, and as I said, the, there was a two thousand. 2009, June 2009 shareholders agreement, which had to be renewed numerous times to numerous to mention, mm -hmm. and uh, because they, it expired obviously, and the last time my understanding that it expired was in August 2016. However, it has not since been renewed since then. Why not? And the reason for that is because they seem to have some um, co controversy between the decisions that the government was, has been making and, and a resolution of the whole CL Financial Clico debacle mm. and, the, and the shareholders, that United Shareholders Limited um, group. Now, where we are now, and I think that's where you want to come to, having, I think, I hope your, your listeners would have appreciated that structure, how, how the thing is set up. And, and how important that shareholders agreement is because that a shareholder agreement is the basis upon which the government mm. has uh, a, a, an effective stake and a, an effective say in terms of what happens at CL mm -hmm. Financial. Mm -hmm. So what you would have seen recently, I think was was it last week in the in the news, in the, in the Guardian, I think the Guardian carried the story exclusively, mm -hmm. Trinidad, Ga, Trinidad Tobago Guardian, is that the CL Financial sh shareholders, which would comprise, based on that falling out, mm -hmm. because there's a letter that was written, and if I get, time, I can probably refer to it, that was written by the United Shareholders limited to the government because they were upset with how the government was disposing of certain assets. Of the assets and, without, and, without consultation. Without consultation, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think the, 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 the straw that probably broke the camels, the proverbial camels back, as it were, recently was the Minister of Finance in his media review statement where he seems to have moved the goalposts significantly. So the goalpost was at 20 billion, just under 20 billion, and he's now talking about 27.7 billion dollars mm -hmm. that that is going is owed by Clico and CL Financial. Listeners, you're listening to Peter Permel, who is the Policy uh, Holders Group Chairman uh, for, for the Clico Policy Group. Uh, I, I just want to go and hold it right there for a, for a for a minute. When you move from 20 billion to 27 billion, something had to happen there, or you had to justify the claim. What is the justification we had coming from the corporation sold, the Minister of Finance, to explain the disparity between the initial? 20 billion and 27 billion. Well, based on his statements and, and the, the transcripts are there of what he said in the parliament, is that there's a, a, a major portion of that is some $3.2 billion in advisors' fees and additional fees. Now, now that, that alone, uh, you have a huge red flag going up there for me, and, I, and I'm sure for your listeners, is that how can you come up with a figure of $3.2 billion in advisors' fees? To, to, for, for people to kind of wrap their brain around that, you're talking about the, that's about half of what the cost of the point highway, the point four and highway was. You understand mm, what I'm saying? Mm, mm. So that advisors we're talking about here has to be we're talking about um, auditors, we're probably talking about attorneys, uh, we're talking about other co types of consultants. But certainly, there's no way even if you if, even if you have all of those. Um, technical people inside of there, can you, in my humble view, can you arrive at 3.2 billion? And I'll tell you why. I've been trying to wrap my brain around, as I said, how could he come up with 3.2 billion in advisor's fees? 
And even when you factor in the Commission of Inquiry, which I think, mm -hmm. based on media reports, was over 100 million TT dollars. Mm -hmm. If you throw inside of there the Bob Linquist report, which was done early in the game, let's throw in another 100 million dollars inside of there. And even if you throw in, there was another um, uh, forensic audit that was commissioned, I think sometime in 2015 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. If you throw in another 100, let's say throw in another 100 million. You only coming up with three hundred million, and let's just say for good measure, you throw in another two hundred million for incidental, for whatever you know. Let's let's find <laughs> some little stuff to put in there. You still you still don't get to a billion dollars. About half a billion dollars. So how do you get to three point two billion dollars? And the minister just glibly says that at the um, uh, media review, and he doesn't. And I would have thought that he, the second thing he would have said after mention that mm -hmm. is, well, you know, we're going to do a forensic audit into these numbers to determine whether the veracity of these numbers. Because clearly, uh, and, and, and I hope I'm right, it, that 3.2 billion could not have been racked up under this present administration because they came into office in what, late? Yeah, 20, a year and a couple of months. Yeah, yeah, 2015, yeah. October, mm -hmm. October, somewhere thereabouts. Yeah, September 2015. Yeah, yeah. so mm -hmm. I, hate, I would hate to think that they're the guys who racked up this 3.2 billion dollars. So obviously, a large portion of that would have had to have been racked up under the previous administration. They may have accounted for some of it because he said as at April 2017, that was the number that he had, that he, had, that, that he was being told mm -hmm. uh, was, the, was the number. So that's one of the issues that I think clearly has to be addressed in terms of how does he arrive at this 3.2 billion? Was this money actually spent or was this money um, money that he's, 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 he's projecting? That, 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 and, and it just doesn't make sense. If, if, I, get your, if I get your inference, yeah. um, notwithstanding, I mean, say for when we get uh, some detailing of this $3.2 billion, you are saying you cannot see any of the um, actions taken, which is via audits, um, you cannot see a commission of inquiry and so on, that would justify $3.2 billion. Is the implication from that that um, if, in fact, this number is correct, some people have been uh, feeding at a trough? Is that well, the, that would be the obvious implication. I mean, clearly, um, the guys who they sent to take care of the patient were having a field day. You know mm. what I mean? It's like, it's like mm. you're in an accident and the, the, the police and the first responders come, the, the med medical people come to, to, to see after you, and then you find their hands and all in your pocket taking off your watch and your wallet and that kind of thing. That, that's the only implication I can see for that. And to be very clear, you're not saying that is the case with this government or the last government. You're saying during that period something went on to contribute to this, if that number is correct. Well, I want to be very clear. Um, I am saying, based on the minister's statement, there's a $3.2 billion in of advisors' fees that have not been accounted for. Gotcha. Quite apart from the other monies that were spent that, mm -hmm. that, that, that uh, Mr. Afro Raymond has been asking for an accounting for and so on. But, but there's a new number he has introduced. It's a, it's a staggering number. Yes, of the 27 yeah. billion, however, 3.2 is going to leave me with something about uh, 3.8 or, or, or so still. What is that? Um, I that, think he's that, talking that about liquidation, um, sorry, liquidity support costs, interest, and all kinds. I all mean, right, but so he has not, again, he has not accounted, he hasn't given us a break. Down mm -hmm. of that differential mm -hmm. between the 20, let's call it 7.7, .7. let's call it 8, let's round it off at 8. Mm -hmm. So that difference, that $8 billion, mm -hmm. apart from seeing advisors' fees and, 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 and liquidation, sorry, and liquidity support. He has not broken it down in any in any detail whatsoever. All right. Now, we've gone there, and I wanted to go there so listeners can get a clear idea of that subpart. Let's continue with the trajectory you had. Sure. And the trajectory you were on is saying that the, the, the United shareholders got together with the government to give them their percentage, 38. The government owns 14, gives you 52. You can control stuff. You've got um, some directors of their four specifically from the government, including the chairman. They've been working together all this time. But now we have... A fracture because the United shareholders are saying to the government, you need to remove these people because what they're doing is inimical to the best interest of this group. Sure. What does that mean? It means that um, you're opening the door now for a majority shareholder to come in if you've got these two parties um, broken up because you've got 38 and 14, they're not working together. Yes. But you've got a gen you've got somebody with 48. Yes. Is that, the, is that where we have the... Um, the opening of that door. Sure, sure. As a matter of fact, yeah, that is a huge door that is going to be opened there because based on the letter that was published in the newspaper, clearly without expressly stating that, the United Shareholders Limited seem to be working in tandem or in, in, in sync with Mr. Lawrence Dupre. So therefore, because it makes no sense, because let me just explain to you, your, your listeners what, what that letter really was saying. It's saying, look, 
Now, the rights of the CL Financial shareholders as a result of this shareholders agreement or the memorandum of understanding that was signed in 2009 are not suspended mm -hmm. because this is a voluntary arrangement they have entered into with the government to allow them these four directors on the board. So what they are doing now is asserting their rights as shareholders to say, look, those directors, all the directors who are on that board are, are there at our behest. And right now, we are not happy with what is going on here. Mm -hmm. And we, would, we are giving them seven days to get out of Dodge City. You, you understand? And if you don't get out of Dodge City in seven days, then we are going to call what is known as a special general meeting. Mm. And there's a particular section under the Companies Act that allows them to do that. Um, uh, 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 well, so, yeah, any shareholder with 5% or more of a share of a company can requisition a special uh, uh, meeting of shareholders. Sim similar to what was done in the case of TCL. You would recall there was a similar situation where there were directors on the board who were refusing to move. Mm -hmm. They were like, who will see as they will see? They're not moving. And then the, the, the shareholder had to invoke that particular section of the act. Mm -hmm. They called a special meeting. The directors never showed up at the meeting and they passed certain resolutions to remove those directors and appoint new directors. And this situation is no different. What is going to happen if, and I think that seven days might be up, if not if it's not up already, it's probably going to be up by next week. Mm. Because I think that letter was published uh, maybe last week, early last week. So therefore, the, the, what you have here is high noon at the OK Corral. Uh, mm. The government has not responded from my reading of the media um, so far. I haven't heard any response from the government. But the government really is in a difficult position once the shareholders have made that demand on them to either call on those directors to submit their resignations voluntarily, mm -hmm. save yourself the embarrassment, mm -hmm. because we are going to call them. Without saying that, they didn't say what I just said, that they're going to call a meeting. But that is the obvious implication. That's the extent a, An inference of, of, that, of that threat. If you don't take um, follow our demands of removing your four appointed directors, uh, we will take action. Well, what action is there? And you're saying the only action that you can see under the, under, under the structure of corporations yeah. is for them to, yes. if I call this special meeting, yes, yes. and vote out the directors. And, and it means that they, they need to know that they have the votes going into that meeting because these meetings are all about votes and they're not about people. <laughs> so that one person, once you have that 51%, can remove whoever they want off that board. And based on the numbers and, and how the thing is being um, positioned, Clearly, with 48, if, if USL, let's say, let's say Lawrence Dupre still only had control that 48% voting block, and you had USL still siding with the government with their 52%, mm -hmm. then even if he makes that threat, that would be a very idle threat, because when the meeting is called, they will just come there and say, look, oh, you, you want to vote us out? Let's vote. And he would lose the vote. Somebody mm -hmm. here clearly read the art of war. Divide and rule. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are a lot of questions. It's good inside baseball. I know that you've cleared up a whole lot of things for us. And folks may want to just go and grab a, a, a drink of water or maybe grab a cup of tea. We are, after all, having budget. I tell you what, I want you to do that because I have a question for Mr. Pomel that I know is in the public arena. All the explanation he has given is nice, and now we have context. But there is a Woodford Square question, and the Woodford Square question goes this way. Shareholders were not able to save CLF from the financial brink. The government was. <laughs> Why do we only own 14%? That's one question. And to follow up on that, I'm leaving him time and giving you time to digest while you get yourself something to drink. Since taxpayers are still owed 20, or according to the new revised uh, system, $27 billion, can Trinidad and Tobago not demand our money be repaid before any control or decision making is handed over? In other words, are there any emergency regulations that can be implemented here for what was an emergency situation when the corporation sold on behalf of the people of Trinidad and Tobago moved in to bail out? CLF. I'm going to come back and get some answers from my guest, uh, the chairman of the Clico Policy Holders Group, Peter Permel. When we come back inside, Brian Guess is Clico Policy Holder Group Chairman Peter Permel. We're happy he's here. He laid out the understanding as to how the corporation is structured, who owns what, 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 what. I asked him before the break the question that I'm coming back to. Shareholders, it's good that they um, own this percentage, and da, 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 da. but this thing would have gone into the toilet. It was heading there, and everybody's share would have probably been worth nothing. Taxpayers stepped up and assisted. Why only 40% is ours? Not only that, they owe us this money. Is there not an emergency um, piece of legislation somewhere, some, some regulation that allow us to go in and say, you can't do anything till you pay me back because I saved you? 
Right. That's an excellent question, Rennie. And um, before I even answer that question, there's another factor that people are not will need to consider in this whole thing. And as I said, I'm not I'm not bad here to bad for anybody. I'm just mm -hmm. laying it out the facts as, as they are. Okay. There's the whole question of the mismanagement, which is being alleged of the CL Financial uh, Clico debacle and um, mismanagement of the assets and so on. So that's a major, major issue that has now arisen. And you have to remember that the shareholders would have voluntarily entered into these arrangements with the government because they acknowledged that they had, they had, they had dropped the ball. They had messed up, if you follow. But I think what is happening now, they have come back, as you would have read in the newspaper, and said, look, we want to pay you off. We need to know how much money we owe you guys. Mm -hmm. And give us a figure. We're going to give you a proposal as how we're going to settle this matter. And, you know, and let's close this thing off. It's going on for too long. It's over nine years, Eddie. I mean, Rennie, this has been going on. And what has happened is that the government to date has not been able to give a hard number mm. as to how much is, is owed. As I said, the goalposts keep, to keep moving every, every day. And more than that, the government is not, was only talking about how much money was, in, was initially owed. They're not talking about how much money they already got back. Because you have to remember mm. that the government got something like $4.2 billion in 2015. That's under the People's Partnership Administration. And then they got another $2.6 billion quite recently as a result of, the minister of this Minister of Finance's um, intervention. Mm. You follow? Mm. So, so it's 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 there's there's about at least seven seven uh what about seven more, say yeah seven, about seven plus billion dollars that they have already gotten be paid that we are aware of. Mm. So 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 there's a very complex matter. But to come back to the question that, that you asked in terms of what can be done in a situation like this, uh, there's very little that can be done really outside of some executive order or some. Uh, going to parliament to um, to change some law or something like that. And, and remember, this is not Venezuela. This is not a country where you commandeer somebody's company and force them to take positions that are not, uh, that, that you want them to take, you follow? So there's the whole question of the democracy of the country could be at stake. Because once you start doing this, you're setting a, a dangerous precedent for other companies, you, you follow, that the government would, would, would be very, uh, you know, very careful, should be very careful not to, to get into Mr. Purnell, I hear you very clearly, but I pay taxes. It is my money went in there, and I am going that if you were going down this slope where all the value of those shares would have been almost zero, uh, and, and, and I stepped in, then surely thought has to be given, not in a helter-skelter way, but in a, in, 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 in a way of fairness that the taxpayer is represented that his money is totally secured sure. before the company is handed back. I mean, it is one thing to say you stepped in and you put X amount of dollars. Think of the many people and their lives been totally dislocated. Sure. Think of how much the country has been thrown back because of those who had they been in the position uh, and, and received what they expected would have invested more in the country, would have been living. I mean, a whole lot of ifs can come out of this. Sure. So, okay, I'm not asking for uh, th that kind of compensation. I'm saying, however, listen, this is the amount that I put up here. Say you owe me this, give it back to me. And that's why there is so much importance to the point you made. Stop moving the goalposts and say how much is owed. Yeah, yeah, and you see, all of that assumes the parties are acting in good faith. Mm. And, and therefore, that's why there's another door being opened heading to the courts. Because, you see, ultimately, all of this is going to be resolved, in my view, by the courts. Because mm. people are going to be filing legal actions, yeah. left, right, and center. Mm -hmm. And the court is the best arbitrator in, in, in these matters. You know, they are, they're neutral. Well, I, I shouldn't, maybe I should need to correct myself. Given what your, your previous um, discussion you had there, I'm, I may have to reflect on I that. Would, I would <laughs> caution you on the editorial, <laughs> sir. Just keep, just keep going. <laughs> yeah, so, so as I said, yeah, more than likely, these matters are going to end up in the courts. And those questions that you're asking mm. will ultimately be determined by the court. But I don't mm. think these share holders think that they can just come back, take their company and mm. say, thank you very much, bye-bye, see you later. Mm -hmm. They obviously know they have to make good on, mm -hmm. on what is owed and so on. But what they're saying is, based on how the government is managing the process, they are doing an injury to the shareholders. Uh, and, 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 and they're saying that, look, we can pay back this money without that injury. I think that is basically the subtext in all of this, while they have not come out and said that in, in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Because I, I have said it on a program that there's no way Mr. Dupre or any of those shareholders can expect to come back and run those, do business in Trinidad and Tobago as long as the taxpayers and the policyholders have not been paid their money. Because, because what you're going to have here 
is a quiet riot on your hands. I mean, I'm saying that figuratively. Yeah? I don't mean a literal riot because people are not going to sit idly by. Uh, and, and, and as you have clearly pointed out, that people are owed money and allow you to do business as usual. I am happy that you are judicious in defining what kind of riot mm -hmm. uh, you speak of. I will be equally judicious, but not too sure <laughs> barriers won't be crossed if you start telling me that this situation, we don't get our money back. I mean, quite, yeah. quite, quite clear. There is also the question of fit and proper to run a financial sure. institution sure. that's going to come up sure. should uh, Mr. Dupre get in there. I know sure. that you are in constant contact because you guys basically have to do the same thing, which is fairness for all in Trinidad and Tobago. And Afro Raymond has made that very, very clear. This question of fit and proper to run a company after having this uh, this debacle uh, uh, that you just came out of, uh, folks uh, going to say no you're not serious yeah and just one little clarification when you say fit and proper it relates to regulated mm. um, companies in a re regulated industry not companies that are outside so regulated would mean insurance companies banks financial those types of financial mm -hmm. institutions but but it is possible for mr dupre to run his private business which is cl financial it's not mm -hmm. regulated in that sense mm -hmm. it, it, it falls mm -hmm. under the companies act but it doesn't fall under the central bank am act. i glad i got you here this morning <laughs> 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 am i glad that i got you here this morning uh the crystal ball if you will i know it is a very dangerous thing to hazard in situations like these that are so dynamic but um crystal ball if you will you are looking for this special um, possibility of this special meeting being called yes, by the shareholders yes. to deal with the question of the uh, directors that they would like removed. Sure. You see some amicability coming about this? Uh, or you see this is going to be a protracted clash? Well, of I think the shareholders are going to assert their rights because enough water has flowed under the bridge. They would have had enough time between, let's say, August 2016 and now because remember, they, they have they seem to there seem to have been some discussions going on with the government and the shareholders and the back back and forth and so on. Mm -hmm. And based on the minister's most recent statement, which would be the, in the parliament, the media review, he seems to have taken a particular position. So notwithstanding whatever talks were going on, uh, clearly they weren't successful in resolving this issue because what the 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 the, 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 um, the evidence of it being resolved would have been an extension of either the shareholders' agreement or a final resolution of the Clico CL financial debacle, meaning a, a document which outlines how the matter is going to be resolved. None of those and things surface. None of those things surface. So we're in, a, we're in a very, we're between a rock and a very hard place right now. And as I said, I, I can't see them. The train has already left the station. Mm. That meeting, I suspect, is going to be called. The, and the ball is now in the government's court because they have, they, have the, they, they, they have actually drawn a line in the sand and say, look, seven days take your guys off of the board, or else. <laughs> and I just explained to you what the or else is. Yep. You're talking about uh, a majority uh, getting in here. Only 14% owned by us. If they take their decision, they take their decision, they go their way. We shall see how this will play out. Man, I truly appreciate you taking the time to be here this morning. Uh, Peter Permel, uh, who is the chairman of the Clico Policyholders Group. Um, as far as all this is concerned, your sure. policyholders, how are they um, looking at this, by well, the way? Well, we are looking with an e eagle eye at all of this because yes. at the end of the day, the, the government has slammed the door in our faces and said, look, we are not paying you any, any money, any more money, based on the fact that um, there's some alleged agreement that they signed with the, hmm. pre with, with the shareholders, interestingly. <laughs> Uh, well, I should say share with Clico, which obviously uh, means the shareholders and the directors mm -hmm. who, are gov who are central bank appointed. And that is, that is nonsense because the, the, the central bank cannot enter into an agreement not to pay policyholders. They are they're supposed to protect the, protect the interests of the policyholders. And the other thing they're saying is that we sold our rights so we no longer have an interest, which is also a lot of nonsense. You can't sell your rights in a policy. You can assign your rights. So that's another, another battle that is going <laughs> to be bring in the not-too-distant future, the question of sale of rights versus assignment of rights and so on. But at the end of the day, because you may have seen in the newspaper that the shareholders and the policyholders were supposed to have a meeting and that meeting, unfortunately, didn't come off because, mm -hmm. unfortunately, now it seems as though our interests are now intertwined, the policyholders and the shareholders' interests, because the government has taken a position that is at, at, at variance or at adverse to our interests. And therefore, the shareholders are saying, interestingly or ironically, that they are prepared to pay. That's certainly Mr. Lawrence Dupre is saying that he, 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 apolog he apologized to the policyholders last year. And that's when he said, I will have this meeting with you guys. Yes, and mm -hmm. he wants to have a meeting with us. So... 
but they have some they have had a little issue that arose among the shoulders and that is why that meeting didn't come up so hopefully those things will be resolved and that meeting will still come off and then i'll be able to keep you updated ready as to how things are going to go i was just about to ask you please don't change your number on me <laughs> uh, i will be I, I definitely will be in touch with you again uh, peter pomel as our listeners would like to be updated on this particularly as it relates to my 20 or is it 27 billion dollars whatever it is it's a whole lot of money we need to see how this goes yes. thank you so very much for taking the time sir my you, pleasure you, you look rather dapper this morning well, I, I, I i must i must add that you're very kind <laughs> <laughs> or very honest one of the two <laughs> Peter, have yourself a great Sunday. No Thank problem, you so much. Man.